Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think I'd like to get started. I know some of you have been here for a while, probably wondering when this is going to start, so I thought I would, I would get started at this point. Um, my name is Tom Sheehan, and I am a member of the uh, SAGE uh, Research Coordination Network, which I'm going to introduce a little bit in a second to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I really just wanted to welcome you to Northeastern if this is your first time being here. Uh, I hope you get a chance, you know, we always encourage people to walk around, especially if you're from this area. People always said they never knew this was all back here. Um, so please, I hope you get a chance to walk around at some point, uh, either during the break or, or after the workshop. Um, what I want to do is, is just briefly mention that I think this workshop is the result of a bunch of great partnerships that just kind of came together uh, through people wanting to work together. Uh, it really started with the, the COPRI Joint Conference that many of you, I assume, are staying on and attending uh, tomorrow through Friday. And both Louise Wallendorf and uh, Dan Cox were really receptive to us offering this workshop ahead of that of that conference, which was great. Um, I, I also think this is a coming together of a lot of different disciplines between uh, the planners, the engineers, the geologists, and others who are involved in this kind of work, uh, climatology people. So um, this is a little bit of an experiment on, on our part because it's the first time we've offered a workshop like this. Um, but I think the partnership that uh, has developed and brought all these folks together has actually already been a success, at least in, in my mind. Um, I also want to thank uh, the American Planning Association because they partnered with us in addition to, to having a speaker from APA, which, which you'll hear more about later. Um, they also cooperated with us to offer uh, their, their certificate maintenance credits, or CM uh, credits, uh, which again, some of you uh, are going to be getting credits for this workshop, and I think Ann has already um, Distribute some information about that. Um, I wanted to also thank, um, I've mentioned Ann, uh, Ann Kelly, who some of you have been in contact with. As some of you know, um, somebody like me actually doesn't do any of the work for this, so I, I actually just get to stand up here and, and welcome you. Ann has really been instrumental in being an incredible organizer of this event on behalf of our project and, and of Northeastern. So I want to thank her for all the work that she did to put this together. Um, she also can answer any questions you may have about, about logistics, uh, parking, uh, where to get to places. She can certainly answer those questions if you have those um, and should be available throughout the workshop. If you're wondering where the bathrooms are, so I, I want to make sure I cover all the important issues at this point. They are straight out this hall. To the left, so straight down this way, and they're in the immediate left, so they're fairly close by. Um, there will be a break, as you know, at 2:30 between the first two speakers, and uh, there'll be the coffee break will be right out up here. Uh, before I introduce the first speaker, I wanted to turn it over to Elizabeth to talk a little bit about the Sage Network. Thank you, Tom. So I'll take a minute to thank Tom for a lot of this was his idea. Um, thanks. Yay, great job, and, and Kelly did a fantastic job keeping us organized, so um, I'm super appreciative to Northeastern. Many of you, I don't know if you noticed this walking through campus, all the students with their t-shirts. It's, yeah, it's really great to see the students come back. Um, makes it a little intense time for academics, so yay for us to be in here. Um, SAGE is, just very briefly, the, the idea behind SAGE is one of learning of trying to bring together different disciplines and different regions. Um, the focus here today is, is on the different disciplines and the sort of initial insight is that there's a lot going on in green infrastructure and resilience and engineering and there's a lot going on in planning and landscape architecture but what there isn't a lot of is a necessarily conversation between the two fields and so we were hoping to try and contribute to that to create more of a shared knowledge to help move policies forward. Um, the overall research project, in addition, has a co-learning between the U.S. Northeast and the Caribbean, sort of with the insight that folks in the Caribbean are kind of used to getting hit by disasters and hurricanes, and they probably have some knowledge of how you go about planning for that and recovering from it that we may not share. 
because we don't have quite as much direct experience, although we're likely to get more in the future, as we'll hear today. Um, and so, but the U.S. has, you know, we have a certain amount of research firepower here that perhaps we can help share there. And so it's been a great um, collaborative learning process. And I'll bring a little bit of that into my presentation, but the focus here for today, I think, is mostly on MLT. Um, and I think that's enough for now. We can, the other, let me just give you, I'll talk a little more, but the other uh, co-PIs on the grant are um, Don DeGroote, UMass Engineering, and Melissa Kenny, who's at University of Maryland in Decision Science. Um, and so just to give them credit for uh, doing a lot of the work overall project. Um, and I do want to just reiterate the thank you to the Mass APA uh, and the National APA. Peter Lowett is here. Hi, Peter from Massachusetts APA. Um, appreciate that. And to the COPRI folks for being so supportive of this. So our idea is partly that this show may go on the road, right? So we might try and do it again. We haven't, told our, we haven't told our speakers that yet. <laughs> no, <laughs> surprise. Um, and so we're going to ask you to do, if you would, an evaluation. It's a pretty standard evaluation, session by session. And it'll help us improve so that, you know, we do this um, again and we have a chance to do it Thank you. 
Good. Good. So I learned a few things already. First of all, I need to tank it up here today if I don't want to go on a road show. <laughs> That um, needs work. So I'll fill that in before we start. All right. All right, John, thank you very much for having me, Tom. And uh, thank you all for putting up with me for the next 45, 60 minutes. Um, I do appreciate I am highly biased, but I do appreciate the idea that we would include big scale geology, geomorphology, and some climate science in the initial steps of thinking about this. So I, I do appreciate being able to open this in that way. And, and today I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk about um, well, some of these things. And if anybody needs you to read the titles because you are sharing your screen, uh, covers that, and you can the outline. Um, so variability of coal sources. Now, I know some of this is probably going to be somewhat redundant. You may have heard this before. But there's a reason for starting really broad scale as I'm going to. Because um, then I'm going to get into the, what, what I've laid out as the three, or one, two, and three, it should be uh, drivers of coastal change, two level storms and sediment supply, and why each of those is, one of those is important in each uh, very different location. So I will talk a little bit about the Northeast. Um, as Tom said, I do have, I have done a lot of work up here. I've been doing my PhD across Boston. And uh, a lot of that work was in Northeast Massachusetts on Plum Island. We're going to hear a little bit about that barrier island system today, among others of Virginia, of course, as well. And then I'll uh, lead that into the future of the coastal zone and what does all this mean and what do we expect those changes to look like on moving forward. So, starting with the uh, variability in uh, natural coastal systems, what are the main drivers of variability? And I think that most of them are actually summed up in this picture right here of the value line. They're focusing more on the natural coastal system than the developed coastal system, especially at the beginning here. But this shows you right there, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where you can, observe this in this figure, you know, the tidal inlets, waves crash along those tidal inlets. Different types of sediments that, that build these value lines. Uh, fine sediment, uh, silt, clay, organic rich sediment in the marshes in the back there. On the front side, uh, sand, sandy beaches. So all these things interact to form our natural coastal zone. It is by far the most dynamic zone, geomorphologically speaking, on Earth, the coastal zone. In fact, of them, these, as many of you know, are the most dynamic. Tidal limits, where waves tides, sediment supply, and all the things that force changes in the storms, sea level change, human impacts, where they all come together in one location. So starting with waves and tides, you know, just to set the stage for when you think about a particular coastal site and some of the variability that's out there in the geomorphology of the coastal zone, these are the two big and this is a, a very well, it's a well known uh, diagram from the literature that compares wave height to tidal range and allows you to break up the coastal zone into different types based on the wave height and tidal range. Which one's done on a particular set? Is it going to be someplace where you have very small tides by large waves on average, or large fetch facing the open ocean? Or maybe a little bit further south where you have smaller tides, say the coast of Florida. Or someplace where you have extremely large tides and waves don't matter much. Uh, the Bay of Fundy is some of the largest tides on Earth, well over 10 meters. In fact, sometimes it's 25 feet close to 20 meters. I don't know what that Versus here in Boston, it's about two and a half to three uh, meter tidal range. And that drives a large, largely that drives a lot of the variability that we see. So here you see three different sites all along the east coast of the US. And you look at these from a satellite view, and you can tell pretty quickly that you're looking at at least two very, very different types of coasts. And I show you some that are a mix of um, developed, at least partially developed, and some that are natural. So the outer banks of North Carolina. 
you have these very long, linear, narrow barrier islands with a big open bay behind it and very few tidal inlets. Versus either the Georgia coast or the Delmarva Peninsula, both of which are dominantly undeveloped, although especially in the northern part of the Delmarva, you have, say, Wallace Island, now the massive is saying, not the northern part of Delmarva, but the northern part of the Virginia coast of Delmarva is Wallace Island, the NASA facility, which they, that's where the, um, they had the, the rocket blow up and melt part of the launch pad um, some months ago. And then Assateague Island, the southern tip of fishing point of Assateague Island, part National Seashore and part Ocean City, Maryland, in that same area. And what do you notice? With these two sites, many more islands broken up into small islands, a lot more inlets, and a lot more marsh behind them. And that's simple. Very, very simple difference. Smaller tidal range, sub-meter tidal range there. Larger tidal range here. One to two meter tidal range. High wave energy. You're exposed out on the shelf. We stick the outer banks to that a lot further. So segments it's really work in a different way. Here, your dominant forcing is along shore, stretching islands out, making them longer. Here, it is cross shore. But why does this matter? Well, because it's going to drive the way we want to think about managing these different sites. What drives the dynamics of that site? I'll tell you that longshore transport plays a lot smaller role in these mixed energy barriers than it does in these wave dominated barriers. Where if you put up a, a groin or a, a, a jetty at the mouths of one of these inlets here, it's going to have a much larger impact on the downshore shoreline than in a site like this. Where dominant transport is in and out of any. It's cross shore. Okay. The second one to think about here, the second wave type, so the third big one, is sediment availability. And that changes dramatically over an area as small as the east coast of the US as well. So, for example, this is another one of these classics, 1982. Journal of Geology, he comes up with this, looks at the freshwater discharge and the suspended sediment discharge of rivers on the east coast of the United States. And what you see, the size of the river, the width of the river, showing these diagrams, is proportional to its relative either discharge of water or suspended sediment. And what you see right away is that, you know, up here, up in the north, these rivers are pumping out a lot of water as compared to their sediment district. That's up to the, say, the Merrimack River or the Connecticut River, and you'll notice that there's this water up there is, as this is a picture from the Merrimack, it's fairly clear. There's not much suspended sediment. There's not much sediment that's going to be the marshes behind the site of Sam Island, or the marshes along the lower Connecticut River Valley. There's also not as much sand coming out of those rivers to feed the barriers and beaches. And you go for the south, and you know, the rivers aren't that much smaller in terms of their water discharge, but they are proportionally much, much larger. Here's an example from a, uh, a river in, uh, I want to say that is uh, South Carolina. It's coming off the sand peak. And you can see it's, it's, it's chocolate. That's very, very high suspended, suspended sediment load. And that is then feeding these marshes, and helping them keep pace with sea level rise. So one of the things you have to worry about in New England that we don't have to worry about quite as much further south is the ability of marshes to keep pace with sea level rise. Here in New England, the Houston Ho new sediment marshes built both by organic production and by sediment inputs. And if you don't have that sediment input, you're relying entirely on organic production. The marshes fall apart, as you'll see later, very So this is a big one to think about as well. And we can go down the coast. So we're going to give you, kind of give you a tour, not just of the East Coast. I'll actually go West Coast as well, just a little bit. Um, you know, start off, as I already mentioned, Plum Island, Massachusetts. You know, this is uh, Cape Ann and Gloucester. Down there, the mouth of the Merrimack River is right there. And here's an area where you have a very long that's been stable. It's been in place. It's formed 4,000 years ago and it has not moved since. Has it moved? Its erosion rate is zero over a decadal scale. Maybe you've heard something different than me, and I'll return to that in a minute. But over the decadal scale, it is an entirely healthy 
Gary Ryan. Why? For any reason. Not a lot of sand coming out of it, but it's enough. It's stable. Duxbury, on the other hand, further south, uh, near near Plymouth, just south of Boston. Uh, now here's here's first the Merrimack River feeding Plum Island. Right? This drains the White Mountains. You can have some sand coming out. But then Duxbury, here's a whole bunch of old inlets that have blown through. From this is a map from the mid 1700s showing a series of these old inlets. And here they are mapped more recently using uh, uh, geophysical tools, a uh, ground penetrating radar system that we have. And you know, here's a series of old inlets. There's no sediment. The only sediment is actually coming from the cliffs further north, erosion of those cliffs and longshore transport of that sediment. So here you have a system that is falling apart, occasionally with inlets blown through that lasts for tens of years to be mapped, you know, hundreds of years ago. It's not a new phenomenon. Versus Plum Island, yeah, it's fine. Sediment evaluation. Some of you who flew into Boston earlier today or yesterday may have flown over something that looked like this, Thompson Island, one of the many Boston Harbor Islands. Here, you have a very local sediment source. These are relatively stable sedimentary features. In the center of this, the highlands here are glacial sediments. They're called drums in this case. So it's sand and, and gravel dropped by glaciers, eroded. There's one of these erosional cliffs in the harbor, eroded, and that sand is reworked to form relatively stable beaches and islands. Eventually, it's going to be And there's evidence that, for better or worse, that erosion has accelerated in part due to the uh, very simple across the harbor. It's part of the, uh, the commuter system. So, providing more sediments and beaches, but the lack of erosion. So, local sediment sources are important to keep in mind as well. Go down to uh, Virginia. I've already shown you a wild, I mentioned Wild Island, right? the Tonkin Island in Virginia. Here, we have actually very, very little sediment. There's no new sediment source. We don't have erosion of cliffs. We don't have a river. Well, we do have a river. We have those rivers, all the ones feeding the Chesapeake and Delaware. But anything that comes out of any of those rivers gets trapped in these big estuaries and never goes back to the coast. So all we're doing is just recycling the same material over and over. So there you have a case of very limited sediment supply, no new inputs. And it's a very different situation than it came on. Keep going. Now on to the, uh, the Gulf Coast. And here you have the uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas coast. Uh, there, word on the street is that there's a fairly sizable sediment source relatively locally called the Mississippi River. The problem with the Mississippi is that it doesn't actually pump out much sand. And what sand it does pump out, because we have altered the path of that river, much of that sand goes down off the edge of the continent. The muds can remain in the system. Uh, we'll come back to the Mississippi a few times here in the next half an hour or so. Um, the Cat Island in, in the, the Mississippi Gulf Coast is, is, is interesting. Um, this is one of a series in the. That is like the only way you call it. Sorry, I'm working on that. <laughs> I don't know what happened in 2015 when everything went, went bright green. But what you see in this diagram is 1857 to 2015, how these islands have changed along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And what you'll notice is they've shifted a little bit to the west, which is the dominant longshore transport direction, not to the east, not from the Mississippi River, which is, comes out about there, not seven coming that way. No, this is all something driven to the west, partially from her from Mobile Bay, again, that's trapping some sediment, and partially from headland erosion. So they've shifted, fine, but they've also gotten a lot smaller consistently. And a lot of that has to do with this inlet right here and the removal of sediment to keep that open as a major transportation pathway and shipping pathway up into Mobile Bay. They drain that sediment, they're not dumping it on. Corn Island. It's going offshore. 
don't have to dredge this thing this way. And maybe there should be this can come. But this is the effect on the geomorphology. This is a sediment. This is not a sea level problem. This is not a storm problem. I'm not saying those don't affect it, but this is a sediment problem. And this is a human intervention problem. Which is why look what's happened to ship on it. There's not much stuff. Um, very different. You can name go along the east coast as I just did in part, and you'll notice that the entire Gulf and east coast of the U.S. are barrier islands. Marshes and mangroves behind them, barriers in front. You go to the west coast, you cannot name a single barrier island because there aren't. That's not to say they're not beaches, but they're not barrier islands separated from the mainland. And that is also a sediment supply question. And this is one that's largely a natural sediment supply question. And I'll give you just one example. The Salinas River in California. It's, it's the largest river in, in central California. It drains, you know, here's you know, San, San Francisco's up there. You're draining part of the, um, of the, of the central valley there, just east, uh, west of the central valley. And going out and it drains um, into Monterey Bay. Beautiful location, Monterey Bay. Right? Um, and yet, look at that's a that is a sizable river, draining very rugged terrain. You think of rugged terrain, mountains, a lot of erosion, a lot of sediment production, a lot of sand making it to the beach. Yeah, big wide beaches. That's not right. Except there really is there really isn't much of anything. And the reason for that is Geology. And here is the Salinas sort of River coming down into what's called the Monterey Canyon, which drops off precipitously. It's just like the Mississippi River dumping all the sediments off the edge of the continental shelf into thousands of meters of water. The same thing happens here in Monterey, where you lose all that sediment. It does not get reworked, but not much of it makes it along the beach to form. If this, if this canyon were not here, much of this bay would be enclosed and be filled in with a big, wide correlation of these things and building out a thousand meters. Instead, there's nothing. There's all this stuff. So it's very real. So it, it, when we think about the effects of sediment supply, sea level, storms, we can't just consider local or, or, or you know, kind of a one size fits all. You know, this is not a surprise. But here's how geomorphology, geology plays into this. We really have to think about the very localized effects. Okay? Um, and this is this is one of the big ones right there. Um, why you have the Monterey Canyon right up coming out along to where you know up in here? Very, very the red here marks the edge of the continental shelf. We're also thinking of the sea level 120,000 years ago. That's what the shoreline was. Look at how narrow that shelf is. Anything that makes it there, right off the edge into deep water. Nice and wide. At the mouth of the Mississippi River and, and wide along the entire east coast. One other thing to notice quickly on this there's the outer banks. How narrow is it there? You don't have waves moving over this big, wide coast. Their wave height remains very high. Hence, you get wave dominated barriers where down in Georgia, big, wide shelf, your waves are interacting with the bottom over a long distance and you are using your wave energy. And end up with something that's high down. So that's um, the same uh, up here. It's a little bit different. We have strong waves. I can get back to that as well. And here's the end, the end result of all that. Again, I come back to these examples because they're sites that I do study for the active um, development of them. Here is Palm Island of Massachusetts. These are not very small. These are a bunch of shorelines going back to 1912. And man, they saw a plot right on top of them. It's moved in, it's moved out a little bit. A few houses are falling in the water. But generally, this barrier arm is extremely stable. Why? Large sediment coming out of sediment supply coming out of the Merrimack River. Here's Cedar Island in the Virginia Eastern Shore. The red line is the 1852 shoreline, and the black is. 2002, it's moved even further since then. Virginia, I show this next? Yeah. Here's the Virginia Barrier Island. These are their 
what are shown in the numbers here are the rates of migration in meters per year. So multiply by three if you want to keep. Overall, long term, last 150 years, every year you come back to one of these islands, the beach has moved on average 15 feet backwards. The whole barrier is moving. And what's more, it's accelerating with time. So this is a this is the uh, migration rate in meters per year from the late 1800s to 2010. And this is you can see you know it's relatively slow and then sped up in the early or the latest 1800s. Stay relatively stable. Seems to have slowed down. This is actually period when sea level rise slowed down. And look what's happened since about. 1980, the same period when we start to really see an acceleration in sea level rise in this area. So recently, I mean, we're, we're well above this rate. That's the long-term um, acceleration rate. We're, we're triple that today. So each year, it's moving five meters a year, but it's also then moving 20 millimeters per year faster than 40 meters. These things are perfect. Not true for a place like Oman. And it all comes down to one thing. Two things. One, sediment supply. I counted that one to the ground. Two, sea level here is twice, sea level right there is twice what it is in Massachusetts. We'll get back to that in a minute. As you do, we'll talk about the three big drivers of coastal change sea level, storms, and sediment supply. Yes, shoot. Sure. So migration occurs, it's a um, it's a process almost cannibalistic, and it's called overwash. So it's storms. Cross-shore transport. Yep. It is largely going to be here. It's overwash. It's waves breaking up and over the barrier and throwing sand onto the backside. You also do have transport through inlets and into uh, flood tidal deltas as well. That tends to be a slower, more a gradual process. So what this is is a background force of sea level with storms on top. And one key thing to consider is that sea level is what we hear about all the time. Storms, we hear about. It's going to be more storms. It's going to be bigger storms. It's going to happen more frequently. It all comes down to the track of those storms. So how much more would those islands have moved in 2012 if Sandy? Had gone a couple hundred miles further south, or a hundred miles further south than it did. They really would have moved in a lot. Like they would really be throwing off my day quite a bit just with that one storm. So, storm track rather than number of storms makes a huge, huge difference. We would not be talking about Sandy on Staten Island had it gone further east. We would say it would have been the worst thing to happen in Boston instead of Kingston. It's just a little bit of a step. So when you say sea level rise is different in two different places, yes. you're talking about the, the advance onto the coastline versus the actual height of the And I saw the rate of sea level rise. So the, the vertical rise in sea level is, is twice, in, is two times higher in Virginia than what it is in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, so here, it's on the road of three millimeters, three millimeters per year. Down there, it's um, about six. In Louisiana, it's about 11. That's a lot of local factors. What's that? That's relative. Yeah, it's relatively seven. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Which is when you're on the ground, that matters. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And that has to do with more of the United States. Uh, one of the big reasons it's so much higher in Virginia is that the big mills, paper mills, are sucking ground up. We also, there happens to be a, uh, a large meteorite that landed right at the mouth of the Chesapeake 40 million years ago. And that is slipping along this thing and causing the ground to sink just a little bit. But it's also, the same thing is affecting the area here, the Gulf Stream is slowing down. That's another big one. So the slowing of the Gulf Stream, this river of water offshore that's slowing down the laxin, and that's actually allowing water to kind of come back up a little bit. So that's Probably a temporary effect in the next 10 to 20 years, but still. So, we were talking about that. So, sea level. All right, so 
I, I've given, um, I've had the opportunity, I've been in Virginia only about two years now, I've had the opportunity to give public seminars in rural Virginia, in North Carolina. Now, in North Carolina, they have outlined sea levels. In Virginia, they accept that it's happening because Norfolk is sinking. The largest naval base in the world is sinking. So they get it there. They, they care. Uh, they see what we call it's recurrent flooding in Virginia, where they see that each king tide is a little bit higher than the one a few years ago. You know, the highest high tides are a little bit higher. The same storm floods a little bit more. So you get this flooding over and over. It, it, it's a great way to pitch it because you can avoid, as I'm going to be saying, not talk about human impacts of what we've done, why we don't need to go through the climate change story except to know that sea level is climbing and it's rising faster than it used to. Right? And that's the way I've gotten around it there. For here, I'm going to start in much the same way, which is sea levels been rising throughout the world for the last 24,000 years. In fact, it used to be rising you know, 24,000 years ago. Up until about 8,000 years ago, it used to be rising a lot faster than it is today several times as fast as than it is today. This is in meters and on that scale. Down from about 120 to about 10 meters in 8,000 years. And then it came to this abrupt slowdown. It came to this abrupt slowdown and it been relatively flat since. Of course, everybody knows the hockey stick. You know, it's been flat but it's still there. Um, but that's the global change. That's what it looks like if you look at the whole world. And this is the point that Kirk made, the, the global versus the local. The static global, how much water is in the ocean basin, how big are the ocean basins, and local, what else is going on? So during that same time period, uh, one thing I never liked about this diagram as a, for a talk is that each of these is a different scale, 20,000 years, 10,000 years, Understand we're looking at somewhat different time periods, and this is 200 meters, and this is 40. Okay, so, and this is, oh yeah, 1.5. But what I want you to get out of this is to see that it doesn't all look like that curve. And that's very important. There are places in Maine where sea level is still falling after you retreat the ice sheet. It's not all sea level level. It's falling, of course, in large parts of California as well. Not so much at sea level falling, but the land keeps rising. So it's about the size of that city somewhere as well. So you only get stable beaches and barriers where, where sea level is either rising or stable, but slowly rising. Um, and you know, the big take on that is it's in different, different places. The example I, I want to give real briefly is here. Um, in Massachusetts, I've switched my axes. That's 17,000 years ago. That's today. Sea level 17,000 years ago was 30 meters higher than it is today. Here in Boston, this flooded way up the Charles River Basin. Out to at least 95. It was all flooded, all under the water. It dropped precipitously down to 50 meters below, and then slowly came back up. Now, fast at first, and then it is new. It's complex over the long term, but it can be complex over the long term. What I want you to take away is it can be complex over the short term as well. We see changes in some areas in what's called the Little Ice Age, where there is a period in the when right up to the 18, early 1800s where the earth was a lot cooler, naturally, a lot cooler. And you actually saw sort of glaciers expand, ice sheets expand a little bit. That pressed down the earth. And now once those melted, we see the moon down and see all all in place the world is rising up. All because of weight on the earth pushing it down. Because the earth is simply now when we stand up simply floating on, on liquid fluid beneath us. So it's important to keep this this kind of thing in mind. And it becomes really important as you think about the future. You know, here's the IPCC report, you know, with these, you know, the, the satellite data, the uh, tide gauge data, 
you know, measuring reconstructions going back, and then their projections. And their projections are global. This is, I mean, this is the, the best data set out there today showing what's called the hot spot of sea level rise, where this is the rate difference compared to the global average. So global average is about 1.7 millimeters per year. This is where it's anything in dark colors here, in warm colors, is where it's faster. With you know us down there in well, Baltimore's got it real bad. Um, Baltimore's got one of the highest rates. Norfolk has one of the highest rates. Several millimeters per year faster than global average. And this extends up to yeah, that last dot there. We're sitting at the ball. <coughs> Just slightly higher. Remember, I said that Northern Massachusetts is about three minutes to this area. So we're slightly faster than Northern, but not that fast. And this is due to the slowing, largely the slowing of the air So you have to think about the sea level not as that, but as that. What's your say? Where, what do you care about? Where do you care? Sea level forms the big background forcing today. That's what's pushing the whole system. But what actually drives things, like the barriers moving, what actually drives what we see, the flood, the impact, are storms. Um, as, you know, one of the umpteen examples one could give about saying, you know, here it is, a storm entirely changing global morphology, uh, or I'm sorry, beach morphology. You have, you know, this is along Long Island, before and after on the same and it has there were a new inlet blue blue during this one. That one has been uh close. That the front page. Right. And as I said, well if that thing had gone right up towards Long Island, this would have been a lot larger inlet. Kate Cobb would have gotten it real bad. And and quite likely Boston, as I said, it swung around and in that large fetch and that large um, storm surge in the north and east. Yeah. <clears throat> Other examples. Right? This is you know, this is a, a great one showing what happens. You know, here there's one you know, not much infrastructure there. Here a lot of dunes, Kitty Hawk in North Carolina dunes. Overwash zone, and this is it today. So it's not just where the storm goes, but what can we have in its path? And obviously, that same storm doesn't matter back in 1932, makes a big difference in 99 or 2009 or today. Another example back to Sandy. This is a site I was doing some work on recently. Long Beach Island in Jersey. You've got Long Beach Island is interesting. The southern fifth of it is entirely natural. It is this, uh, it's, a, it's a preserve. And you'll notice, look at how far back you can see this. And this is a pre, that's a post storm imagery, uh, sandy imagery. But look at how far back the natural beach sits from the developed part of the beach. Why? There's breakwaters, there's, there's a groin, series of groins, there is bulkheads there. So they're not allowing that to move. This whole thing, storm after storm after storm, had slowly migrated this back. What's outlined in blue there is the overwash. That's the barrier. Kind of wetting itself and rolling over itself. And that's what's been allowed to happen naturally. This is a satellite image from immediately after Hurricane Sandy, two days later. And that is a snow cloud pushing sand back onto the beach from the road. Bottom the road back onto the beach. It's obviously not allowed to wash over. So storms had a dramatically different effect. Where they hit, how big they are, how high sea level is, what part of the tidal cycle are in. Are we in high tides when it hits? Does it last long enough to see several high tides? And of course, how developed the area is. Yes. Yeah. 
this one here, yeah, this yeah. this split building out. There is a continuous supply down to the surf zone offshore of the um, drains as well. So some of that is bypassing that beach system. Some of it is moving to the beach system. Um, the offset is entirely at the zone. I mean, what would happen? Not that this would move back more but, or less, but this would move back more. And it not. That, that's more. And it would have been straight and probably for and the whole thing would have been straight. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's not just the same as well. I mean, I mean, you know, here's, here's Dawson Island in Alabama. The same house is shown there from the USGS uh, with LIDAR data. You know, same house, kind of like that. And there it is just before Katrina. And there it is after Katrina. So this is pre Ivan, post Ivan, post Katrina. Seven. Now, humans have been, this is argument, and uh, mostly it's in the uh, archaeological literature. When did the Anthropocene begin? You all heard the term Anthropocene, right? So, when did the Anthropocene start? And people are saying it was in 1800 when we could start to see increased carbon dioxide concentration. It was in the, uh, you know, oh, recently, now we see a layer of plastic. Along the sea floor, whatever. We have been moving land for the last 10,000 years. Think about the period. We have been greatly altering the landscape for a long time. And in recent times, once we've mechanized that, it has more affected the coastal zone than any other time. And here's a great example this is San Francisco Bay at three different times 1849, and this is, of course, projected for 2020 with infill, and this is 65. Right? What happened in 18, between, soon after 1849? Sorry, you know, that's what it is. Right, exactly. Strip mining for gold. Eroding massive amounts of sediment, going down those rivers, choking the rivers, choking the bay, and infilling that bay. And it's still twice as high today as its initial. Uh, as it's pre anthropogenic sediment mode. But we've done the opposite too. We've built dams. Yeah. 1900. 1950. Which one of those docks is a dam? 2000. Oh, yeah, there's our western migration. Yeah. Take just one example. There's the Mississippi River. There it is again. They use things like how wide is the drawing to tell you how much water is coming out, or, or in this case, sediment, right? So here's the Mississippi River in 1700 with all its tributaries. And here it is you know, later, 1990. Yeah, a little bit dated now. But we've lost 75% of the sediment. And you know, more recently, this charge on 40% of the potential sediment load. What does that mean for the coast? Now, you've probably seen this in some form before. These are one of these land loss diagrams for the Louisiana coast, where, and I know you've heard this before, they're losing a football field an hour of land in Louisiana, along the Mississippi Delta. And this just shows some of that. The red is all of your land loss. The yellow is additional predicted land loss. And the green, it's right, it's right there. The green is land gain. And we're going to talk about the four sites that I've highlighted there. Uh, the Atchafalaya, Open Ears, Timber Ears, and Barataria Bay. And these are different examples. Because in terms of in terms of being smacked by everything, this is it. You have subsidies. You have relatively high rates of sea level rise naturally. Combined, you have 11 millimeters free of sea level rise. You have that coming off the sediment supply. And what sediment does make it goes out here and out off the edge of the shelf. You also have storms. You also have subsidence due to extraction of fluid, water, oil, and the subsurface. This has got it. This has got it all. So we'll go through some of this. So let's start with the open ears. That's the open ears right there, this headland. Right? 
coming out of heaven. And this is it. That is 1853, 90, 34, 78, 88, 2005. That's just an example of the massive landmarks. The headland, the marsh back there, has entirely eroded, and the beaches and barriers almost entirely done. This is Algebra for Life. This is a fantastic paper that came out six years ago. And it's partly a, a, a modeling study. But this is looking at that rock Floyd Delta, that little bit of green that we saw building out. And this is them saying, all right, I'll, I'll step you through this fairly slowly there. Okay, we start at the top. Then we're required to fill a combination. A combination, you know, how much space there is for the seven, okay? Um, which sea level rise of one? <laughs> One millimeter per year. And that's the blue. So over time, going forward, that's how much sediment you need, increasing over time to fill the, and that's that's background, that's not subject, it's just the overall. Right? Just to fill that space created, you need that much sediment. If it accelerates, you need that much sediment. That's what those two are. Here's your modern supply of sediment. Right? And a mass balance with accelerated sea level. Your modern sediment supply somewhere in the middle. Your mass balance, though, when you take into account sea level rise and sediment supply, you are far below the break even mark, is what that's showing. And what it's effectively saying, we need to greatly increase more than double the sediment supply to allow us to keep that up. How are they going to do this? Well, there's great talk, they've already started, of rerouting at least part of the Mississippi River, a third of it already happened. Down the Atchafalaya and out into Rockford. So that's an example of how to address it. Send the river somewhere else. Get the sediment where it's needed to build land. Um, it doesn't always work. Here is the East Timberwears. Also, again, yeah, so let's go back a little bit to that diagram so we show you where we are. Right. The Timberwears right here. So we are just now east of the Ogden so I showed you. I'm marking the back of it. So here are the, the East Timberwears. The story, 1999, dumped a lot of stuff, large scale beach management project to help restore these barriers. Here's what happened 2011 to 2012 during the storm. Totally got wiped out. Now you see waves crashing right on the marsh behind those islands. The islands were eroded down to Subaqueous shoals. So, what's the solution now? That's East Timberwear, which I just showed you. They are managing, managed retreat these days. They love a lot of storm and sudden supply coming together. They are sacrificing East Timberwear to stop. And this dotted line here is where they're going to put the new shoreline uh, between Calumet and Castle Tech. So that is going to be the future shore, and that's what the nation is talking about. Managing the truth, stepping back. The other one, of course, is the sediment that I told you about in my modeling study. So here's, again, there's the bird foot, the timber ridge where we just were. That is uh, Barataria Bay. This entire area is Barataria Bay, and that's where they're trying to create marsh. So here they are taking water. From the Mississippi River, right in this area, pumping it, this is a pipe pathway, and trying to create land. Right now, they've built a thousand acres, it's a thousand more under construction. By sucking water out of the Mississippi and dumping it over there. There's a challenge with this. There's some really good work looking at the marsh that forms as a result. This is marsh fed by fresh water. Freshwater marsh is a lot less stable, a lot less um, resilient. To storm surge and the friction effects of waves rolling over the salt marsh. So it works, but I'm very curious to know from an outsider's perspective, non taxpayer in Louisiana, um, how it's going to hold up the next time of Katrina or Rita or Ida. So, where does this leave us? Trying to get a sense of the diversity of how sediment support waves. Tides, storms, sea level, all play into the coastal. What's the future of it? 
I'm going old school with this one. This is the broom. This comes out of the store. And it hasn't kind of changed. And this is our best understanding, definitely gap, which basically says if you're along a soft shoreline, a sandy shoreline, and you have sea level in the dark blue, at a certain elevation, with the dark brown and that, that solid line is your shoreline, and you raise sea level a little bit, you're not just going to passively flood more land because it can move. It's sand. You're going to erode back a certain volume of material to maintain what's called an equilibrium profile. There's your equilibrium profile before, there it is after. You take that chunk of sand and stick it offshore. So your erosion is actually a factor of 50 to 100. Sea level right, raised by one, by one foot, you would expect, the assumption to correct, that you're going to shift the shoreline back 100 foot, 50 to 100 foot. Pretty drastic change. So what do you do? And here are some examples, including one from back home. You all know this a lot better than I do. Uh, some of the things, but I think it's, it's one of those, I sure like the natural barriers to beach in Florida. I mean, Galveston is, is a clear disaster, but Galveston is also a uh, Here's what we do back home in these, in these breakwaters. So this is uh, my office is somewhere in there. And we have all the breakwaters forming these nice wide, wide ish beaches. And a low energy water and upper chest. But it's not just the beach. It's not just what's going on when the waves are crashing. It's the back barrier as well. It's the marshes. And I'll explain to you why the whole two are intimately interlinked in just a minute. But this is, you know, the famous Morris uh, model, threshold model, response model here. Saying that, all right, for, it, simply put, we're saying that you can only grow marsh so fast has so much above ground production of marsh, which is what allows marsh to keep up with sea level rise before the whole thing starts to collapse. So at a certain rate, you're going to have marsh collapse. Once sea level rise hits a certain threshold, and I will tell you, we don't know what that threshold is. It's different in different places. It's probably a lot lower in a place like northern Massachusetts or Connecticut or Rhode Island, where we don't have any fine sediment in input, than it is in a place like, let's say maybe the, the um, Mississippi Coast, where you have a lot of fine sediment. So that's, so, because you need both fine sediment and organic input to help marsh keep pace. If you don't have a fine sediment, your threshold is lower, and the marsh starts to deteriorate, and starts to end up on the falling side of that curve. And that happened. Here's Virginia. I showed you before that acceleration in barrier migration, bringing those numbers to how fast things are moving. Here is Cedar Island, which I also showed you a diagram of. Here's Cedar Island, actually, in the 1850s, in Paramore Island. Everything in blue is outlines of marsh in the 1800s, okay? Watch it closely. Back in 2009, go back. So you can watch how the barrier moves. And watch how these bays get a lot larger. We are losing the marsh. Bays are getting larger, marsh is falling apart, and the barrier, that's your difference. That's all marsh loss in red, gain in red. In the last 150 years, we've lost 20% of our marsh on the eastern shore of Virginia. It's drowning and it's being eroded at the barrier beach. Popping out on the front side, being eroded away by the And here's what that's doing. This is the conceptual model that we're working with now, and that several groups are trying to test. And this basically says this. You start out with a stable coastline of barriers and marsh or mangroves behind those barriers. In stage one, the marshes start to fall apart, which is what we're seeing. We're seeing it in Palm Island, we're seeing it in Virginia, we're seeing it in Louisiana, we're seeing it in uh, South Carolina, we're basically seeing it everywhere. So sure. slightly different reasons. Because we are seeing Palm Island. We are seeing edge erosion in Palm Island, and we are seeing uh, larger uh, pools and ponds than we have seen in historical documentation. 
that's the change you were looking for. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what I think could be the future. Is that this is actually a great model for a place like Point Out. We're not there yet, but we're at the point where we are moving marsh and the battery is not moving. And what that does is that increases your tidal force. Tidal force is the volume of water the such a high. Tidal force is the volume of water that moves into and out of the tidal in the same the tidal. tidal. Mm -hmm. So it's that volume between high and low tide. If you have more open water, you have more space to flex. So your tidal curve is smaller. If you lose marsh, you increase your tidal curve. And if that occurs, you need to move more water in and out of the inlets. The inlets have to get larger. You sequester more sand on your ebb and flood tidal deltas because you have larger fluxes of water going in and out. So you build larger deltas with those. You become more cross shore, tide dominated. Your roads are barriers. Your barriers start to fall apart. This is the projection for a place like Palm Island if the marsh loss accelerates in the next 20 years. Likewise, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, they're saying the same thing. This is, you know, an older, some older work that's, that was projected here, showing more inlets breaking apart of the island, and eventually just a very little left of what we know to be the same process. So in summary, the future of the coastal zone is very subtle change today. In Plum Island, 2008, in response, to that erosion that was occurring then, due in part to trapping the sand behind dams up the river system. This is what it looks like today. We go down. River. That's not too far from Galveston. Great if you own the house, you're protected, not great if you own the beach. This is Cedar Island in Virginia. 2010, 2012, two years. Gone. Same house, same pilings. Those pilings are in very detail. So short-term increased erosion, shifting shoreline and uh, marsh erosion, but long-term, think about the total breaking apart of barriers, the rapid erosion, migration of beaches, and the eventual stabilization. And the long-term could be as short as 20 years. With that, uh, Thank you so much. It was, it was a great opening talk to set the stage for, for what's happening out there. Um, I, we have time for only a couple questions. I don't want to get too far behind schedule. Uh, are there any question, other questions for Chris before we move, move on? Yes. Some of your maps suggest a sort of a solid back shore. You get rid of all the marshes. Things just stop moving. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. Yeah, was that really going to be the case? I think that was. So, one of the things we're looking at is like, is, okay, so sea level is rising, marsh goes in the inner tidal zone, and we should be converting what's now near shore back barrier to, uh, to wetlands. It's not happening as fast as we're losing the marsh. Well, in some places, parts of Bay Chesapeake we've seen that we actually are creating new marsh. Eventually, though, on the open coast, those barriers moving so quickly, they would probably get pinned and just become, well, it makes me wonder if a place like Virginia Beach was once not a barrier beach, but a barrier island. It was once separated and not pinned. So that is one of the potential things that could happen. You know? It's a worse problem, of course, during coaching upon development. You know? you know, Virginia, it's all, it's all uh, farmland, not a city yet. Uh, one of your maps showed the coastline 120,000 years ago. What was the sea level at that time? Sea level was, the map is really weak. <coughs> Actually, it's, it's 120 meters. 120 meters. Yeah, globally it was 120 meters long. 120,000 years ago. Globally. In some places it was higher. If not, I want to thank Chris again for his great talk. Um, I think I'm going to ask Elizabeth, do you want to introduce, want to introduce Jim? Yeah. 
prevent you from having to listen to my growing voice for too much. I was just thinking about the marshes. I got some days. <laughs> marshes. And I was serious. That was really fantastic.